Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. This is Sayed M. Savian from the Department of Philosophy at Loyola University of Chicago. My presentation is titled Avicenna and the Universality of the Impossibilia. So my talk will have four sections. An introduction, I introduce my uh, problem, then question and thesis. Then um, I will move to the main argument I want to talk about. And then the last two sections would be in the first part of the argument and the second part of the argument. First introduction. Before that, let me give you an example of the problem I'm going to talk about. Consider universal concept, let's say goat. You know, there are different instances of goat out there. And you, you think about goats by, by grasping concept, universal concept goat. Suppose you are thinking about other things using a different universal concept, like, for example, a stag. And furthermore, suppose that uh, the, the first universal concept and the second universal concept are incompatible or incompossible, if you like. So nothing can be both a goat and a stag, for the sake of argument. The question is, if you put these two concepts together, you put goat and stag together, uh, it seems that you get a new concept. Is this concept universal and intelligible or not? It has been argued, and it is believed that Avicenna thinks that the new concept is universal and intelligible. It seems to be, in fact, a consensus. And now I will be trying to, in this talk to argue that um, as far as we have Avicenna's authentic works, we have good reasons to think that Avicenna does not believe that Godus Dag is a universal or intelligible concept. So that's the main claim. So at the end, I will touch on some open questions that my argument raises. But um, this, I need also to explain the wider context um, of my argument. So back to introduction. Michu edited introduced in the study a short treatise titled The Letter on the Disappearance of the Very Intelligible Forms After Death, the letter for short, as I refer to that. And many scholars, uh, um, for example, Ergen, Anawadi, Mahdavi, uh, included Michu himself, Deborah Black, uh, Durart, among others, have attributed the letter to Avicenna. Um, and um, presume its authenticity in their interpretation of Avicenna's philosophy. A couple of words on the letter itself. The letter argues for a basic principle according to which the impossible forms uh, in the Arabic Mahalad are both imaginable and intel intelligible, attempts to explain how one can intellect or intellectually apprehend impossibility and concludes that after death, the impossibility dissolve from the rational soul and one no longer intellect um, such forms in contrast to real intelligibles that the still people are able to intellectually apprehend them. My main question and thesis go, go like this. First, this is the question. As far as the philosophical and logical content of the letter is concerned, is the letter consistent with Avicenna's view in his major works? And my thesis is that this is not the case. Otherwise, would I will give a negative answer to this question for four reasons. First, the letter's uh, explanation or alleged explanation of how one intellects the impossibilia is not consistent with how Avicenna explains our apprehension of the impossible forms. And I use apprehension and um, intellectually apprehending or intellection in two different senses. So apprehension is not necessarily intellectual. Second, the letter's argument for the claim that impossibility are intelligible because they are universal does not employ Avicenna's notion of universality. And third, the letter's a structure is incoherent in a way that Avicenna's view is not. And finally, and fourth, the letter's central presumption that after death, the faculty of imagination will no, will no longer be active is questioned by Avicenna at least on two different occasions. Putting all these, two, all these four reasons together, um, 
I conclude that unless one supposes that Avicenna changed his views um, on a range of fundamental topics such as intelligibility, universality, estimation, imagination, in a single short treatise for which there is no independent evidence, it can reasonably be concluded that the, let the letter is not Avicenna's and hence should not be relied upon in interpreting his philosophy. Having said that, I think a separate study on the history of the letter, the manuscripts, and the transmission of that is required to have a kind of a more decisive uh, judgment, to make a more decisive judgment about the authenticity of the letter. So my argument is limited in the scope. It just focuses on the logical conceptual aspect of the letter. Furthermore, in this talk, I only uh, talk about my second reason. So I will focus on one paragraph of the letter, the paragraph in which the author attempts to argue that impossible forms are intelligible by showing that impossible forms are universal. And then after explaining the argument, I try to compare that argument with what we know about impossible forms uh, from Avicenna's authentic works, and then I conclude at the end that um, the, the argument in the letter is not consistent with Avicenna's view and suffers from both uh, logical and methodological problems. Now, the second reason. This is uh, the paragraph I have taken from the letter. Let me quote. Indeed, the reality of the intelligible, by intelligible we mean something like concept, intelligible form, lies in this. The form exists in the soul and is devoid of position, designation, and the rest of that in which the intellect does not admit commonality. So every form which exists in the soul in such a way that is, that is possible for the intellect to admit it commonality is universal and intelligible. Now, among the impossible forms, there are some which have this characteristic. For example, the belief that the Anqam Urib you can translate it as phoenix, um, exists in ray. Whoever admits its existence, i.e. the existence of phoenix or Seymour, in ray also admits that it can be more than one individual. He therefore believes something universal and this, and, uh, and this thing is intelligible. As the first view, i.e. that the form contrary or mukabil to the real is not at all intelligible, is impossible or un untenable, therefore remains that this form can be intelligible. End of quote. I have justifications should be understood. So, 1-1, one, one, the antecedent of 1-1, one, one, if a form exists in the soul and is devoid of position, designation, and any attribute in which the intellect does not admit commonality. So, Position or designation are attributes of material objects. So material objects have particular location. They can be pointed out, so they can have designated. Can be designated. So these kinds of these attributes can be called particularizing attributes or material accidents. So the antecedent of one one reads like this: If a form is in the soul exists in the soul and is devoid of material accidents, then the form is intelligible. I would call this uh, lack of material accidents, being in the soul and being devoid of material accidents, complete immateriality. So, so basically one one says something like this, if a form exists in the, if a form is completely immaterial, therefore it is intelligible. One two the antecedent of one to reads like this, if the form exists in the soul, it is possible for the intellect to admit commonality. So ad ad admitting commonality in the form does not, is not synonymous with uh, being completely immaterial. So to have two different um, terms, I rephrase the antecedent of 1.2 and refer to that as universality, the criterion of universality. So 1.2 can be reformulated as if a form is universal, 
therefore it is intelligible. So the, the difference between 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, is in their antecedents. One of them tries to say that complete immateriality is sufficient condition for intelligibility. The other one, i.e. 1-2, one, attempts to say that universality, which is existing, a form exists in the mind, and it's possible for the intellect to admit, admit commonality in that. Universality is sufficient condition for intelligibility. So, this argument can be analyzed in two steps. First, 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, that I will return to it, um, shortly as, a, as providing a lemma for intelligibility. And second, the rest of the argument that apply this lemma to an impossible form, in this example, see more, and concludes at the end that the impossible form in question is universal and therefore intelligible and therefore some impossible forms are intelligible. I think both the steps of the argument, i.e. the step that attempts to give criteria of intelligibility and the step that attempts to apply that on one, impos one impossible form, both the steps are, are questionable. So the last two parts of my talk will be about the, these two steps of the argument. Uh, first, um, step one. I want to argue that the move from 1-1 one, one to 1-2 one, um, is problematic, as others have uh, noticed, but the justifications provided to, to make that move um, look plausible do not work. If immateriality, to which Black refers as abstractness, so what I call complete immateriality, is uh, referred to as abstractness, implies universality, but universality does not imply immateriality or complete immateriality, then the move from 1-1 one, one to 1-2 one, would be a form of association fallacy. In other words, if complete immateriality is a sufficient but not necessary condition for both intelligibility and universality, and one cannot substitute immateriality with universality in 1-1, one, one, um, then one cannot substitute um, immateriality with universality in 1-1 one, one because they are not equivalent, because one does not imply the other. And I think this is the case. Um, a possible solution is to justify the argument, um, as Black suggests, uh, by saying that within the context of our discussion, of, uh, intelligibles corresponding to material forms, um, um, abstractness does imply universality, or complete immateriality implies um, universality, and universality in turn implies abstractness. The two criteria are coextensive. I think. There is a deeper issue with this uh, solution, and that is this is not the notion of universality that Avicenna works with. So Black is right in suggesting that the letter presumes that the complete immateriality is coextensive with universality, but the issue is that this is not consistent with Avicenna's notion of universality. So I will go over three main definitions of universality. We find Avicenna's uh, the healing and remarks and admonitions and then compare them to what we have in the letter and stain, uh, show that um, universality does not imply complete immateriality as presumed by the letter. So these are the three definitions we have. Definition one is like a universal is a nature of tabia, the very conception of which by the intellect does not prevent commonality in it. So we have kind of, first of all, it's um, about the very conception of tabia, nature. Second, it's kind of double negation, the very conception of which by intellect, by the intellect, does not prevent commonality in that. So, um, assuming that prevention itself is a negative uh, concept, so it does not prevent, so it's kind of double negation used there to explain why, what uh, universality is. Then you have definition two, a universal is a meaning meaning is a translation of ma'ana, whose very conception does not prevent it from being predicated of many. So you have the language of double negation again here, does not prevent it. 
But you have, instead of commonality, now we have the language of predication, being predicated of many. And definition three, a universal is any meaning predicated or predictable of a non-restricted many. This time, we don't have the language of negation. We have the language of predication, but what is um, different at the end is a proviso on what the predication is of. So the predication is of a non-restricted many. I will explain this, this, uh, this proviso in a moment. As far as I can see, there is no reference, no direct reference at least, to, to complete immateriality or abstractness in the definition or characterizations of universality. Avicenna talks about natures or meaning. He talks about um, commonality or predicability. And he talks about non-restricted many that the universal meaning can be predicated of. He never talks about, at least in these uh, three definitions we have, which are the main definitions we find, about complete immateriality of, of the universal. I think if we go to the remark, to remarks and admonitions, in fact, we can find a counterexample to what we have in the letter. A counterexample in the sense that Avicenna mentions a universal form or intelligible form um, which is not completely immaterial, i.e. it is associated with material accidents and uh, still it is intelligible and universal. So text 17 is taken from remarks and admonitions. Any meaning predicated of a non-restricted many is intelligible regardless of being valid for one individual as in your utterance, son of Adam, or not, as in your utterance, human. I should add that by son of Adam, Avicenna means son of a particular person. Adam is intended to refer to the first human being, prophet, um, according to Islamic her heritage, Adam. And the meaning of son of Adam is used as a universal intelligible. Son of Adam, in virtue of its very conception, just to apply the definition of universal we had in remarks and admonition, son of Adam, in virtue of its very conception, is predictable of a non-restricted many, i.e. anyone can be um, son of Adam, or son of Adam can be predicated of, but it's not completely immaterial because it's not completely without particularizing attributes associated with, uh, with Adam. So you need to understand Adam, the meaning of Adam, and only by putting the meaning of Adam and the meaning of son of, you can get the composite meaning son of Adam, which is an intelligible universal, but is not devoid of um, accidents associated with Adam. So this is one example of a universal meaning which is not completely immaterial. Second, if we go to the second, the, 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 the proviso non-restricted many, if one quantifies or a restricted many, and I'm taking this from Tusi's uh, commentary on Avicenna's remarks and admonitions, if one quantifies or a restricted many, by an utterance like every one of those people, accompanied by an act of demonstration specifying the people in question, the resulting meaning, i.e. the meaning of every one of those people, that meaning, that composite meaning, is not universal. Hence, according to Avicenna, um, the conception of every, or the concept, or the intelligible, or the form of every one of those people is not universal, even if it contains a universal quantifier, every, and it's predictable of more than one individual. I'm emphasizing these two aspects because I want to use them in the next stage of my argument. So you may have a judgment that contains a universal quantifier. And in fact, the judgment is, is true of more than one object. So the subject term has more than one instance. But it still, it doesn't follow that the whole judgment or the whole uh, belief contains an intelligible universal as its subject, at its subject position, even though it contains universal quantifier, and the whole judgment is true of more than one 
um, object because it doesn't satisfy the provides a non-restricted many. Every one of those people is only is only true of the individuals included individual in that set, in the set that we have designated by our uh, act of demonstration. So these examples, I think, show that Abbasina, first of all, did not think about the notion of universality in terms of complete immateriality. Second, he provides counterexamples for that, that something can be universal without being completely immaterial. So we have now a problem uh, justifying, even in the context of the argument we have in the letter, the move from 1-1 one, one to 1-2, uh, the two different criteria of uh, intellig universality and um, intelligibility. Now I want to move to the second part of the argument. As with the second main step of argument, um, the application of the lemma of intelligibility to an impossible form to see more, I would like to mention a prima facie textual problem and then a deeper twofold issue, methodological and logical. The textual problem is simple. Argument one is intended to show that some impossible form, the Simor, for example, is intelligible by showing that it is universal. So one expects that in one three, that is, among the impossible form, there are some which have this characteristic. The impossible form refers to the meaning or the concept or intelligible form of the Simor. Um, and this characteristic refers to universality, because we want to show that this intelligible form is universal, and then assuming that every universal thing is intelligible, we want to drive, and we want to conclude that uh, that impossible form is intelligible. However, in 1.4, that is, for example, the belief that Seymour exists in Ray, the author of the letter presents the belief, or al-i'tiqad, that Seymour exists in Ray, not the meaning or conception of Seymour as an example of something uh, universal. This move conflates between the universality of the form or impossible conception and the universality of the belief containing the impossible form. As far as I can see, never in the healing Avicenna conflates between uh, conceptions and beliefs. And the reason is that uh, he thinks that there is a fundamental division between two uh, kinds of knowledge. One is called conception, the other one is called assertion or judgment. And therefore, it is very um, odd to see that in the letter, Avicenna attempts to argue that the conception of Phoenix, for example, is universal by talking about universality of a belief or judgment containing that conception. That's a textual problem. But I can see that some people can go around this and explain, well, if we can show that a belief containing the conception sumo is universal, then automatically uh, we can um, conclude that the subject position of that belief um, is filled with a universal concept. So maybe that's Avicen, but what that's this is what Avicen is doing here. I think what I explained just right now about every one of those people is is also counterexample this to to this method. So we now have a methodological issue. And the mythological issue, has, I think, is deeper and twofold. Um, and it's about 1.6. And 1.6 reads like this. If one admits that Seymour can be more than one individual, one believes something universal. Uh, methodologically speaking, given Avicenna's notion of universality, a meaning is universal if and only if, in virtue of its very conception, it's predictable of a non-restricted many. So the key is that it's very concept by its very conception Avicenna means the proper or proper conception of something. 
Let me give you an example. Uh, if one misapprehends Zaid, an individual, and forms the belief that there can be more than one Zaid in reality, on in ray, would it be an argument that the conception of Zaid is universal? I don't think so, at least for Avicenna. It wouldn't follow the conception of Zaid is universal because someone using a kind of improper conception of Zaid, misapprehending Zaid, can have the belief that there can be more than one Zaid. Perhaps it only follows that the person, I mean the one who, who formed that belief, has not properly conceived of Zaid. And the more fundamental logical issue is that um, 1.6 implies uh, employs um, a, a mistaken lemma for universality. As discussed above, not every meaning that is predictable of more than one thing is intelligible, universal. Um, so we already saw the counterexample, every one of those people. Some form of cognition, and now I'm uh, trying to provide a second counterexample uh, using Avicenna's view, including compositive imagination and estimation involve conceptions or forms that are predictable of some, but not all instances of their species. In a longer paper, I've tried to provide textual evidence for that as well. So, an imaginable form in virtue of not being fully determined by, uh, fully determined may be predictable of some hypothetical instances, and one who imagines this form may come to believe that there are more than one instance of, uh, of that form in existence, but this is not sufficient to uh, conclude that the, the imaginable form is intelligible universal. So, I refer to two texts, uh, and text numbers refer to two texts in my, my longer paper. So I think there are we we have reliable pieces of evidence to think that even the last two parts of two sec two steps of of argument one are not consistent with Avicenna's view. So as far as I can see, this argument, the argument that I referred to as argument one, is um, conceptually problematic and inconsistent with Avicenna's view. That's one of my reasons for a content-based argument um, against authenticity of the letter. I have three more um, reasons that I'm not going to discuss them today. I think putting all of them together, we have um, good reasons to think that the letter is not uh, Avicenna's. I want to end by two points. First of all, I think the letter, though perhaps not written by Avicenna, has been written by someone well familiar with Avicenna's philosophy. I discovered during the last stages of my uh, research that um, a prominent Persian Avicenna scholar long ago um, guessed that the letter is written by Abu Abdullah Masumi, a student of Avicenna, on an examination um, occasion. He did not provide any um, piece of evidence in his uh, commentary on Avicenna's words, so I'm not sure to what extent I can rely on that, but that that's one possibility. Second, I think saying that the argument for intelligibility of impossible forms in the letter is not consistent with Avicenna's view faces um, a very significant open question, and that is, what is Avicenna's view about intelligibility of impossible forms? I have tried to answer that question in my, my paper. Um, but I'm not sure that my, my answer is, um, is complete. For one thing, I think impossible forms are not only um, part of our ordinary discourse, like talking about phoenix or as we use them in fiction. In fact, we need impossible forms, I say we need impossible forms, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, natural sciences and metaphysics. And the reason that we need such impossible forms is that in many of uh, reductio arguments um, in natural sciences, according to Avicenna, and in mathematics, 
and in metaphysics, we introduce uh, something impossible and then try to um, show that the absurdity follows and then close the argument saying that such a thing is not possible. In, in natural science, for example, Everson has argument for the impossibility of the word. The argument is reductio, so he assumes the word exists and then the argument uh, goes through uh, by showing that there are some impossible um, conclusions follow. In mathematics, many of the, uh, like the greatest even number does not exist. Well, the, 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 the proof goes through assuming that there is such a number and then showing that this is impossible. This kind of leads to contradiction. And in metaphysics, like um, Zedullah or the anti-God or the second God, was impossible, the argument goes by assuming that there is a second God and showing that this is impossible. So in all different um, sciences, um, like natural sciences, mathematical sciences, and me me metaphysical sciences, metaphysics, we need um, somehow to talk about impossible forms. How these arguments um, are understood by Avicenna and analyzed, that's kind of open question that I would like to turn to um, next. Thank you for your attention. I hope uh, you, you enjoyed the talk and please send me any, any email, via email um, any criticism, question, suggestion, or point that you may have. Great, thank you.